living in London, so poor that often we had to pawn our property, our furniture, my wife's gifts that she had been given at our wedding. They went to be pawned in the pawn shop. Sometimes we could not pay the rent. In fact, eventually we were evicted. And again, this is something that you know happens here in Durban. People are being evicted even from their shanties and shacks where the, the red ants come in and destroy their, their living quarters where they're struggling to survive. Here we are in London. Sometimes, I have to tell you, I found myself walking barefoot in the snow because my boots were at the pawn shop. We had pawned them in order to get money to buy bread or milk, necessities for the children. And it is under those circumstances that the children grew up. But Eleanor, Tassie as we called her, is very aware of what was going on, especially at a time right there in Soho. The British hanged in public two young Irishmen who were part of the resistance in Ireland. They were hanged there in Soho in the midst of a cheering, drunken crowd. Hanged in public. Hanged till they were dead. And Eleanor Otassi, my daughter, was so moved that she became involved in supporting the struggle of the Irish against the British. She was 15 at the time. So I said to her, Tassi, you are only 15. You, you shouldn't be caught up at this age in the struggles of the world. And she said to me, you are wrong, Moore. Her nickname for me was Moore, because I was darker than some of the others. You're wrong, Moore. I'm 15. I'm not 13. I'm not 14. <laughs> I am 15. And at 15, I am willing to take responsibility and to take action against injustice and against oppression. And, of course, I could not argue with her about that. Well, she went further. She said, uh, Moore, why is it that you are always attacking the Jews? And I said to her, you are wrong. I, I'm not attacking the Jews. I'm attacking capitalists. And some of them are Jews. She said, yes, but you yourself are a Jew. And, but you, you, you were baptized. And I said, yes, that is true. It is in Germany, it's very hard to be a Jew. So I admit. She said, yes, more. But you are not just baptized. You were also circumcised, weren't you? You were circumcised. And I said, a young woman really shouldn't be talking about these things. She said, you were circumcised more, and from now on, I'm going to wear a badge that says I am a Jew because I am going to support the Jews wherever they are oppressed. So you can see the wonderful young woman, very bright and, like her mother, very critical of my writing, telling me that I should always be clearer, more committed, more engaged in the struggle. And, of course, as part of that, there were exiles and refugees coming all the time from various parts of Europe. People who were involved in struggles and got into trouble with the police or the secret police, just as you know, people could get into trouble yeah, in your country. So among them there were people from Germany and France and Italy. And I worked with them, and we argued, and we discussed. One of them, 
as some of you may know, was Mikhail Bakunin, the, the anarchist who, with whom I was in argument very frequently because he dismissed me and he dismissed uh, Friedrich Engels and said, you are mere ingrained bourgeois yourselves. You, your own values are bourgeois values. And so, of course, we got into arguments about that. He was, I'm afraid, very much a utopian. So, in many respects, we were bound to disagree. But one other friend who visited, was someone called Pieper from Germany. And Pieper was a regular visitor. And then, on one occasion, he came in great excitement. And he said, he announced to me and to Jenny, Ah, I have formed a Marxist Workers' Association, and we want you to come and address the Marxist Workers' Association. And I said, what is this? He said, well, we meet regularly. We discuss your writing. We analyze it, and we stick to it faithfully. Faithfully, we are always there, sticking to your word and analyzing your word. So, we want you to come and address us. And I said, I'm afraid uh, I can't do this. It's what? You can't come and speak to us? The Marxist Workers Association? I said, no. I can't. Why on earth not? Why not? <laughs> I said, eh? Because I am not a Marxist. <laughs> I am not a Marxist. And I was making a point that all this dedication to individual leadership, I myself, and I recognize that I could make errors like anyone else. And indeed, one of my great errors, I think, is to be too optimistic in my predictions, what I saw was happening in Europe at that time seemed to be such a crisis that I did not think that capitalism <laughs> was going to survive. But I have to admit it. I underestimated. I was too confident. I made mistakes. And I'm willing to admit those mistakes. It seems to me I underestimated the capacity of capitalism, its ingenuity, its ability to change, to, in a sense, reinvent itself. And so, in our time and in your time, certainly capitalism has gone through many changes. And yet, much of that was predicted, both in the Communist Manifesto and in my writing, and particularly in Capital. And one of the things I predicted, which you're seeing happening now in your own time, is what is called globalization. Big word, we think now we all understand it. But long ago, I predicted that capitalism, in its need, in its search ever for bigger and larger profits and bigger and larger markets, would insist on what was called free trade. And free trade is the ability to cross borders, to enter countries, to be able to exploit on a scale unparalleled previously, unprecedented before. And of course, that is part of the evolving process by which the bourgeoisie developed technology and communications and ability to travel. So that we now are in a situation of unprecedented wealth for some, but for others, hardship, poverty, misery. If anything, 
are even worse than they were before because the tension <coughs> has grown even greater between those who become billionaires on the one hand and those who are in the gutter, desperate and poor. Although they may have been part of the struggle to bring about change. And so, that leads me to a further warning. Just as we had people who wanted to use Marxism, Marxist ideas, and build a theory around it, there are people now, as you know, who have used Marxist ideas, revolutionary ideas, ideas of struggle, creating a better society, and then when they have achieved power, they forget the pledges they made, the promises they made, the commitments they made. Suddenly, those are swept into the dustbin. And as you know, and as others have described it, including a professor right at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, they will talk left, but at the same time they will walk right. So the policy they are pursuing even while they are using the rhetoric of struggle. That policy is a policy not merely of capitulation to corporate power, but worse, it is of collusion. They are in bed. They are the prostitutes of our time, collaborating with the oppressor. And so we must understand that not all those who talk left and indeed offer left prescriptions for solutions will necessarily adhere to those prescriptions once they have achieved power. We've seen it in this country, we have seen it in South America, we have seen it in Europe. So it is important that we ourselves understand very clearly what the struggle is about, and how we define that struggle, and particularly how we commit to opposition to that struggle, so that we are not willing to betray, to compromise, to collaborate, to prostitute ourselves. It is happening, of course, in your country, as it is happening elsewhere. I, I cannot resist giving you two very specific examples. The one has happened in the last week or so. There is a case in New York, a case where the victims of apartheid, those who had been wounded and tortured and mutilated, and those who had been bereaved of their sons and daughters who had died, in the streets of Soweto and elsewhere. They went to a court in the United States to appeal that the corporations that had made all those millions out of apartheid and cheap labor and oppression, that there should be some reparation paid to the victims. That was the case. It was in court. And then, as they applied for reparations, to their surprise, they discovered that the South African government, through its Minister of Justice, had filed an application with the judge in that court, asking the judge to throw out the case. What did that mean? It means that in the case where we were looking for justice for the victims of apartheid, we find that the South African government 
will act in defense of the corporations against the people, the citizens of South Africa. It is an appalling situation and I hope that the citizens of South Africa will get so angry that they will demand that the South African government and um, present Minister of Justice Bridget Mbandla, as well as the previous Minister of Justice Penwa Maduna, that that application to throw out the case of the victims should be reinstated. And instead of the throwing out, we should instead have our court for those victims being argued in the courts of the United States, challenging those 24 corporations for all the millions that they made under oppression in South Africa. That is an example that I felt I should bring before you. And I will bring one more, perhaps in some ways even more alarming. You may know that at the present time, one of the most valuable commodities in the world that everybody is chasing after and it's worth millions is platinum. And the corporation that was big under the apartheid called Anglo-American, taking out the gold and the diamonds out of South Africa, is now been morphed into something called anglo Platz. And anglo Platz is in there in Limpopo, frantically digging for platinum and making millions out of it. That's part of the story. There's another part of the story. On that land, people have been farming for generations. They have lived there, they have planted their crops there, they have kept their cattle there, they have buried their dead there. And now, Anglo Platz is throwing them off the land, sending in the security, Sending in the red ants, sending in 